Okay. Um, so we, we talked about this result that um, uh, said that uh, if you have a projection estimator in, in the normal means model, um, then um, you would have this bound in which um, there is this term which is um, related to the Gaussian complexity of this centered um, um, and um, restricted object. So you, you center your um, set at the theta star and then you have a ball um, or a blow up a ball around that point. And uh, as, as the radius increases, see how fast or basically how uh, the Gaussian complexity of that set grows. And um, uh, this, this is the key quantity that appears in the bound. And then we argued a little bit um, that um, generally what we do is uh, we try to um, solve an equation like this. And if delta satisfies that, then um, so sigma is the noise level and is the dimension of the space. Um, so the smallest delta that satisfies this we'll, we'll call critical radius. Uh, and this inequality we'll call a critical inequality. And um, this, um, um, Delta would be a direct upper bound. Delta squared would be plus sigma squared over n would be a bound on the um, um, uh, per coordinate, basically, um, um, expectation of theta hat minus uh, theta star. So this is like an average. So if you think of this, this is one over n summation i from one to n um, theta hat i minus theta star i is squared. So this is like an average um, um, error pair coordinate or average pair coordinate error. And so this is controlled by delta um, n, which is the critical um, radius, okay? Um, so the majority of the like, work is then to bound this quantity and then solve this equation. And uh, we saw that, um, so we did this in the context of sparse um, regression. We showed that in that case, um, these bounds would give you um, um, a result in terms of the prediction error. So um, this is the quantity that we did not discuss in the um, uh, regression um, chapter. I mentioned that there are three levels of results that you can talk about. Um, controlling the deviation of beta hat uh, to beta star, controlling the um, prediction error, which is this quantity, and then controlling the support, so recovering the support of beta star, which is the hardest drop. So we, we, uh, we talked about like controlling deviations like this, so recovering the parameter consistently, um, not necessarily its support. So that, that's the kind of result that we had there for the lasso. This is a um, sort of um, um, weaker result in a sense, or uh, if you want, uh, not necessarily weaker, but um, the type of result that you care about, um, let's say machine learning, um, that um, in, in which your, your parameter is not necessarily of interest, but um, the value of the function, which is gonna be this, uh, that's of interest. So this is saying that f hat of xi, where f hat is the, the, the function um, that is estimated via regression. Uh, so the function here is, um, f hat x is, is beta hat transpose x. So this is a linear function. Um, so in this sense, this is a very special case of regression. Linear regression is a special case of non-parametric regression where you restrict yourself to class of to the class of linear functions. So so this um, the um, empirical norm between the two functions is um, um, so we're saying actually the expectation of this. Is, is bounded by, um, by a quantity like this. Um, and, uh, and this is sort of, we talked about that this is a, a fairly sharp result of two constants. That's the best you can do, let's say, in the sparse regression. Um, the other approach is more general, which is um, using um, metric entropy ideas to, um, to bound. So this is directly calculated, or um, I believe you will in, in the next homework, show that, um, so there was a key, key step here um, that requires you to show that the Gaussian complexity of um, a set like 
um, the image of a, a, a L0 ball under a linear transformation intersect with some L2 ball of radius delta. You want to control this. And, um, and, and you, can, you can obtain sort of bound like this for that quantity um, directly uh, using the techniques that you, you learned in this course. Um, there is a more general approach um, which allows you to control this Gaussian complexity uh, via the so-called uh, Dudley's integral. So the version that they stated here is, um, um, is, is doing it for a, for a net. So, so suppose you have a delta net of T, um, then uh, when you take the supremum um, over the net of this um, uh, quantity, so this is basically the Gaussian complexity of um, the net, um, this goes from, the, it, this is bounded by an integral. Uh, this is called the Dudley's integral, or entropy integ integral, sometimes written as J in some books, um, J of epsilon and T. Um, so this is, um, this goes from delta over four, which is this delta net up to U, U is, is a bound in the diameter of, of the set. So the diameter of a set is just the maximum distance between any um, pairs of point uh, from the set. Um, so um, in particular, if you have a uh, good control, this is the L2 um, um, covering number. So you're covering T in balls of radius two, sorry, radius epsilon in the L2 norm. Um, so if you have a good, good estimate of this, you can calculate this integral. And this gives you a good bound on, on the um, Gaussian complexity. Um, and there was this little exercise that um, the Gaussian complexity of the set would be within delta root n of, of the net. So combining the two, um, we got that um, there is this upper bound on, on, on this quantity. So the critical inequality is this guy. Um, and then we need to um, um, satisfy this. So we, we replace it with an upper bound. So that's, um, if we solve that, that would give us the critical inequality. So we can relax it. By, by, by putting an upper bound here. Um, and then there was like a little um, trick that you, um, so you manipulate this. So instead of trying to do with, to go from delta to U, you, you'd go, this would be delta, this would be um, delta squared. So you go from delta squared to delta. So generally delta is small, so delta squared is smaller than delta. So because you're, this is restricted to a ball of radius delta, the diameter is, um, let's say, two delta. Um, so the diameter goes here, which is, which is proportional to delta. And then you go up to delta squared. And you can see, once you go up to delta squared, this part, um, this is going to be delta squared. Um, and um, so what you get is um, um, a delta squared. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the here in this, in this um, argument, this was delta tilde. So we did it with delta tilde. Here's the, the uh, delta tilde. I'll take delta tilde to the um, delta squared over sigma. And, and you can see then this, this is sort of this order. So as long as I guarantee that this is of this order, then we're, we're going to be done. And that gives us this nice um, inequality that if, if you solve this inequality um, over delta, um, you would get. Um, an estimate, an upper bound on the critical inequality. So delta that, that satisfies this would satisfy the original critical inequality. And so it would an upper bound on the smallest delta that satisfies um, that inequality. Uh, and so any delta that comes out of this uh, can, can directly sort of upper bound the error. So any question about this? So this is not um, something trivial. So this is a fairly sophisticated result. Um, um, oftentimes you go, as you, you see, you've seen in examples, I, I don't have any example in mind where you need to keep this. Um, uh, so you, you often replace it with zero. So you go all the way to zero. That's the first upper bound. And um, sometimes even this, this, like you can just bound it by one or something. So this, this ball is inside some bigger ball. Um, so the key here is just um, that this quantity um, itself is dependent on delta. So you can see that the, because of the radius uh, delta appearing there, so this is gonna be dependent on delta. So when you take the integral, the result still depends on delta. Um, sorry, this, yeah, that, that's, 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 uh, 
that's great. Um, uh, let's see. Questions about this? Okay, so then we went over the um, non-parametric regression setup, and um, I'm not just, um, uh, I just assume that you, you now by now are familiar. So there's this map that maps the normal mean um, Niels model to the um, 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 non-parametric regression model. And then you translate um, all these norms. So, so this, this plays the role of theta in the normal means model. And um, so you'd have um, this normal means model, theta star would be uh, this, delta, I mean, sigma tilde would be this, and y tilde would be that. So if you rescale your uh, observations by root n, um, then everything would be in the normal means um, territory. Um, the projection estimator would correspond to the um, an estimator that 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 um, restricts, uh, so at least a squared estimate where you restrict f to the class f, um, and so in order to control the entropy, uh, um, metric entropy of delta, you'd 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 control the metric entropy of f, um, and we saw that, or like you can e easily argue that the L two norm um, in the space of theta is bounded by the soup norm in the functional space. So you could, instead of covering in the L two it's enough to cover in L infinity. Um, this you can um, argue for yourself that if you have two, two norms um, that respect an inequality, if you cover in the larger norm, uh, that would give you a covering automatically because this side would be less than epsilon. If this is less than epsilon, this would be less than epsilon. So any covering in, in the infinity norm would be automatically a covering in the L2 norm. So this is a relaxation. So we work with this um, and then the L2 norm in, in the theta domain would be equivalent to this empirical norm, if you recall. Um, and so the, the, the end result is that the, um, um, the this, this L2, this quantity would be just N, uh, N here of F, sorry, epsilon and um, F, let's say F star delta, that's the quantity that we get. And then um, uh, this, this empirical norm is further bounded by um, um, the infinity norm. So uh, you'd have that this guy is bounded by um, this guy. And, 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 and estimates of this quantity are, are known for certain classes of functions. So, um, um, so if, if you like everything, once the dust settles, you would get um, that this, this is a critical inequality where um, we replace this with n infinity. And then this is the class of all functions that are um, 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 let's say in F. So this is, you recall, this is, if you want to unpack this, this is equal to the set of all functions that are in F. Um, basically something like this, sorry, all the functions that are like f minus f a star such that f is in f and um, the L2 norm of f minus f a star, the empirical norm of f minus f a star. This empirical norm is less than uh, delta. So that's the class of functions that, that look like this. And uh, this is inside a class uh, which is F minus F. We can take the intersection with the, let's say, empirical ball, or we could further drop that and just bound it by F minus F. Uh, that would be the easiest. So I, I, I had a comment which was, which was not correct. So we, we don't usually drop this. Um, instead, we drop this. I said, uh, we drop this, and then this would be dependent on delta. The other way is true. So you drop this, and then the delta would be, would be there. So that's what we did. Um, for the um, for the Lipschitz class, so suppose you're trying to estimate a Lipschitz function, um, what you can do is um, um, so the the f hat here is um, you're minimizing one over n summation i from one to n um, y i minus f x i is squared, where um, 
f is in the Lipschitz class. Uh, you might ask, how do I solve this, this optimization? I'm, I'm not talking about how to solve it, but um, assuming that you can solve it, this is like the type of, um, I'll maybe talk a little bit about um, solving something similar, um, but um, um, assuming that you can solve this constraint optimization problem, find among all uh, functions that are ellipsids, um, the, um, um, the function that minimizes the distance to this. And um, so you can imagine that this cannot, I mean, just, just to point out, if you have um, like uh, maybe the true function is like this, uh, if you have a lot of noise, um, when you try to solve this, um, in general, if you just let it be any function, let's say any continuous function, I can just interpolate perfectly. This is not going to be a function, but let's say if I minimize it over all continuous functions, I get an interpolation. Um, this is bad. This is not a function, but you can imagine. Okay, so it goes through every point. Um, however, if I like restrict myself to the ellipsids, um, I can, for example, at some point, let's say if I go through, um, yeah, if I go through, for example, um, this point, then I have to just drop down to, drop down very fast to this, and this violates the Lipschitz assumption. Okay, so um, this slope here is, is, let's say, larger than L, so I can't do this. So when you try to optimize this over all, all Lipschitz functions, you'd have to like respect that. So you, in the end, the, the, you might not, maybe this is not gonna be the best option because then you have to draw fast. You have to maybe go past through this um, maybe not not through that. I mean, you end up like having something smooth. Okay, so just imagine. Um, so this is really a, a, a like a interesting constraint. It's not just um, this class is not necessarily. Um, the question is, um, is it going to be possible to uh, interpolate? Um, and if you choose L small enough and the noise is big enough, um, most likely you can interpolate. So um, there's going to be some um, some smoothness imposed, some smoothness um, imposed, um, imposed by this uh, constraint. And so you get a nice um, fairly smooth, let's say, uh, this might be your um, estimate, depending on how fast you allow the derivative or the, the this is basically an upper bound. Um, so if this is this is equivalent to saying that f is almost everywhere differentiable and uh, f prime x is less than or equal to L um, for almost every x. So you're imposing a like a hard constraint on the derivative of the function and that, that makes it smooth. Um, you can't like jump very fast. Um, okay, so um, this is like the abstract um, projection estimator that we are analyzing. And um, the, all the theory, so it goes true. Um, um, and, and we have an estimate of this. Um, I didn't talk about this, but um, maybe I'll, I'll post it as a whole. So it's in the book um, in chapter five, he drives a lower bound and you can perhaps obtain the upper bound as well that the um, uh, metric entropy uh, for this class, uh, first we, um, um, we are looking at the Lipschitz class with, with, with uh, a Lipschitz function. I'm gonna replace it with F minus F, um, this with F minus F, and then this is inside the F2L two, two, two Lipschitz with, with constant 2L. You can, you can easily see that if I add two functions um, that are Lipschitz, um, so negative F is again, um, this is equal to f. So this is equivalent to just f plus f um, because um, this is a symmetric class. Um, and then this is inside Lipschitz with, with two, um, with, with this being replaced with two, okay. Um, do people see this? Is it like clear or? So, so you can argue this, this is not the, the difficult. Um, and then what you'd get is um, 
um, you you would um, you you have a bound on on this quantity, the uniform uh, entropy number, uh, metric entropy of of Lipschitz class, and this is like up to constants L over epsilon. Um, and then you 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 replace this with zero, and this goes all the way to delta. You solve this, and and this side gets you this. The other side is um, delta over uh, delta squared root n over sigma, and then you solve. Uh, you solve, and you'd end up with um, a critical radius, which is this guy to the one third. And when you replace it, this is delta squared plus sigma squared over n, and you'd see that this is um, in general um, the bigger the bigger quantity because um, this goes like um, one over n to the two third. This goes like one over n. This is faster. So this is absorbed into this. And so the overall rate is that. And then I, again, emphasize that this is, is, is not a, um, this is not the classical rate at which estimators converge. The, the classical rate is this. Um, or if you do, do it without the square root, this would be one over root n. Um, so the, the rate one over root n, um, if you want, um, like if you do it one half, um, that would be, one half and this would be one third. Um, so the rate, um, so let's say I'll say, say it here. So um, F hat minus F a star and one half um, is at most um, L sigma squared over N, one third, uh, much slower than um, let's say sigma squared over N to the, uh, one half, which is um, um, so root n. Um, this is root n consistency, which is if you go back to the like 200d, the estimators that we proved uh, consistent, they were root n consistent. So you do to prove root n like theta hat n minus theta converges in distribution to normal with mean zero, let's say, and certain variance. Um, this is saying that this side is big OP of one, if you remember. So this is saying that theta hat minus theta is big OP of one, um, or theta hat n is, let's say, theta star, if you want, um, uh, plus big OP of uh, one over root n. So that's how you can write it. So the error here goes, um, goes like uh, one over root n. Um, or in general would be sigma over root n. Um, here we have uh, uh, the power of one, one to the third, okay, which is much slower. So the ratio of this side to this would go to um, um, infinity, right? So, um, so this, is, this is showing that estimating a general Lipschitz function is in general a harder problem than any finite dimensional estimation problem. Um, and, that, and these rates are of interest in, in, in theoretical statistics because um, different classes of functions, um, the estimation of different classes of functions, the rate would, would determine how, how, how hard the problem is. So this shows that this problem is fairly difficult. Um, and you can see that this comes out because of the fact that this looks like this. So it's a direct consequence of the entropy, um, the scaling of the entropy. Um, and um, if the scaling of the entropy was um, like d log one over epsilon, which is for the parametric class, then this integral would be finite. And um, the other side would just give you uh, um, the, the parametric group rate. Um, whereas this, because of this nature of this, um, you would get, you'd get a different rate. Uh, so this, this part depends on delta and you would get a rate which is, um, um, problematic. Um, okay, not problematic, but, but slow. So does this like this was a little bit fast towards the end, but this is an interesting example. It's like the prototypical non-parametric problem, and um, now you have like a, a sort of complete complete understanding. So what we don't know is that is there any estimator that actually does better? So this was one estimator. Um, is there any other estimator that actually achieves this rate? And um, we could show that um, this is called the minimax argument, which we, we probably won't cover, um, that the infimum of this guy over all possible estimators um, 
of, let's say something like um, um, supremum expectation of f hat minus f star. Um, this is f star in the Lipschitz class. So this is the maximum risk. Um, um, uh, this is going to be lower bounded by uh, up to a constant by by this quantity, something like this. Um, and so this shows that there is no estimator. So for any estimator, there exists a Lipschitz function such that you pay this price. So um, in a sense, this estimator is minimax. Uh, this is minimax optimal. Minimax optimal in the sense that um, it achieves the, the smallest possible rate. Um, so this is in last chapter of your book, talks about the techniques to show this. Um, there's a bit of information theory um, involved because to show this, you don't, you have to like say there is no estimator. So you have to sort of um, reduce the problem to something without knowing the end in particular estimator. For, for, for obtaining an upper bound, it's just enough to show one estimate. For a lower bound, you have to do like a, indirect argument to show that this problem, no matter what you do, um, this is the price that you pay. Um, this is an interesting argument. Oh, we'll see whether we, we can talk about this or not. Um, but um, um, if, if you com combine this lower bound with this upper bound, then, then you basically um, fully understand this problem from a theoretical perspective. Uh, in practice, how to compute the, this is not resolved because the question is how, how do I solve this? Um, um, uh, that's a, like a different question. So um, any questions, comment? Um, okay, so so maybe I'm gonna like go back to the proof of this. Um, provide some hints. So you can see that the result is quite powerful. So the only thing that we need to prove is, is to prove this. I'm going to state um, the proof um, in terms of a bunch of lemmas and then um, let you fill in the details in the homework. Um, uh, so that the, like the sketch is also in the notes that I posted. So let's see what the, the theorem is. So theorem one. So um, Let's say sketch proof, sketch um, the proof of theorem one. So um, let me, this is like a, another um, basic, anyone, let me ask anyone, did anyone look at the proof that is in the uh, notes? Are you still on? Yep. Yes. So no one has looked at the proof. Okay. So this is again a basic inequality argument. Um, so anyone remembers what what the basic inequality argument was, or where did we um, where did we encounter such an argument? Uh, was it for showing like the error bounds in lasso? Yeah, so seeing another example for the error bounds in lasso. Um, any any other place you remember from like the two hundred B? Is it the M estimators? Right, 200B. Um, if you go back, um, um, seen also in the proof uh, um, consistency of M estimators. The way I, I presented it, um, it's not presented like that, but the way I presented it, it's just clear that it's a basic inequality argument. Um, and then if you go through like all the, most of the chapters in the book, um, 
the only place that, let's say, for example, we didn't uh, use that argument was in the um, thresholding estimator of those covariance matrices. But if you go through the book, in most of the chapters, what, what the, the, the main tool for establishing um, these um, consistency results, because the main, mostly they're talking about um, optimization based estimators, the basic tool is this basic inequality argument. So that's um, why I try to emphasize it's a very powerful technique, um, which is very simple, but very powerful uh, at the same time. So anyone remembers what the, so let me recall what the, what we are trying to show. So theta hat is argmin um, theta, um, theta belongs to theta, uh, theta minus uh, y minus theta, say L2 or L2 squared. This is a projection estimator and y is actually um, theta star plus sigma w, where w is normal with mean uh, zero at covariance identity. So what is the um, basic inequality argument here? Maybe Naveen, uh, because you pointed it out, uh, do you remember what what the argument? Uh, I I think it's something like uh, the inner product of theta and W is less than or equal to. I would it be the two norm of theta? Uh, uh, so, yeah, we have to guess here, but there's a simpler like there's the first step, and then we can figure out what the rest is. So what is the first step before doing this? What is like the basic, what is that basic inequality that, that people write down? Uh, I think it's, is it that like, it has to do with like the feasible theta versus the optimal theta? Right, great. Right. So yeah, so this is feasible. This is inside theta. Um, it's feasible for this problem. And this is the optimal solution for this problem. So there should be an inequality here, right? Right. So what is that inequality? Uh, it would be like y minus theta hat uh, two norm squared is less than or equal to y minus theta star two norm yes. squared. Right, exactly. This is the basic inequality. That's like the start of everything. And um, the reason being that this is optimal, optimal, this is feasible for the problem. Okay, so you have an optimization problem, you have a feasible solution, which is hopefully your true solution is feasible. Um, your estimator is optimal. Um, and so it says that um, if, if this is optimal, then the, the cost function should be smaller for the optimal versus the feasible. Um, then you do some, um, algebra, and if I have done it correctly, this would give you the required. Um, so you'd get one half theta hat squared less than, uh, let's say, sigma w theta hat. So this you can do here, theta hat is just the deviation, what we're after. This is the same notation I used um, in the less so um, slides. So this is nothing but just using this and this definition of theta hat, delta hat, and the squaring and simplifying. Um, hopefully this is correct, so you could double check. So this is the inequality that we have. Uh, so what is the next step? This is a random quantity, right? This is random, this is random. So this, this, this quantity is hard to control. Um, delta hat depends on W because it's, it depends on theta hat and theta hat just depends on Y, Y depends on W. So um, these two quantities are not independent, W and delta hat. So that's the key quantity to control. So anyone has an idea how to control this? Mm -hmm. 
going to say just a naive bound, any bound. What is a naive bound here? How do you like found a uh, inner product? I care about the L2 norm of delta, right? The L2 norm of delta hat. I guess by assuming they're the same, like the two vectors are equal. Um, these two are equal. Um, so what is that like? Given given an inner product, what is the like the basic inequality that not the basic but the most common inequality that people use? You remember what we oh, use? Cauchy Schwartz. Right. Can, yeah. Schwartz or Holder inequality. Yeah. So if I do Cauchy Schwartz here, I, I would bound this by the naive bound would be um so I'm just doing it to see um what we are going to do next is, is non-trivial and interesting. So this is the Cauchy Schwartz, okay? And then I will cancel this out. And so what I conclude is that um, delta hat is bounded by sigma over two times this. So what is this guy? It's a zero mean Gaussian. This is zero mean, so what is what is the size of this? Uh, it converges to root n. So let's say, right, so if I do a square, this is gonna be bounded by sigma squared over two expectation of this guy. So what is this expectation? This is something like that, right? This would be n, right? Yeah, so you get n sigma squared over two. And then if I like pair coordinate, that's the, the error that I mentioned. So this is like theta hat minus theta star. That's, that's the quantity that we care about, the one over n pair coordinate error. This is gonna be like bounded by um, sigma squared over two. So this is not going to zero, no matter what n, 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 n is. So the bound that we got is like delta squared plus sigma squared over n. So you can see this goes to zero, this in general goes to zero, maybe slowly, but goes to zero. Um, okay, so this is the naive, naive idea, right? Um, and it's, it's worth trying out to see like um, what um, what we can do. So what, what do we... Um, not use here. Do you remember what, what the assumptions were? So there is an assumption about theta. So we need to use the structure of theta. Um, so theta is assumed to be, to be star shape. Um, and believe it or not, this is like the key sort of, it's, it doesn't seem to be, but we need to like get the theta involved. And, um, the way that we did it in the L1 norm case was, was to get the L1 norm involved or, or like the L1 ball. Here we need to do that as well. Um, so this is not obvious how to do it. Uh, and I'm gonna state this um, and I, I, you prove it in this sort of lemma. Um, let's see, star, whatever. Uh, this is um, uh, show that, um, for any uh, u bigger than zero, uh, I'll, I'll sketch the way in the homework problems and you'll show it. This is less than or equal to the maximum um, for any delta basically, less than or equal to the maximum of um, delta two over u um, and one times g of u t. Okay, this holds for all delta in um, theta, theta star. Okay, this is, this is the center theta. Um, so this guy belongs to theta, theta star. 
because um, theta hat belongs to theta, and and this is the set of all things that are elements of theta minus theta star. So for any delta in in, in this entered set, this holds with uh, probability bigger than one minus e to the negative um, t is squared over two, where um, g u t is just what we had before. So this is gamma of theta theta star u um, plus t u. Okay, pick any u, um, then then by truncating to to the u, um, um, something like this would hold. Um, so this is the non-trivial piece. Um, so you can see this is a uniform result. This is similar to, to the things that we, um, so in the regression we did like the restrict eigenvalue um, uh, problem. That was a uniform result, but that was a lower bound. This is an upper bound. So this says that for any delta, um, this is bounded by, by this. And this delta, I mean, is, is in uh, theta of theta star. Um, for, for any delta in that. Um, so th the reason why we need a uniform result because I wanna apply this to a random quantity, um, which potentially is dependent on W. Um, so I can't say for any fixed delta this holds, I, I want it to, to hold for, for all delta in that, um, in that um, set so that I, I can then apply it to. So assuming that this is true, which you will show, then with probability then with probability bigger than one minus e to the negative t is squared over two, we have, um, I'm, I'm gonna apply it with random. Once you have it for um, everything, this, this is gonna hold um, with that same probability for this guy. So you get delta hat two divided by u and then g u t. Um, and you can see that um, instead of getting the, um, like this times the L2 norm of this, we get this times some sort of an interesting quantity here, uh, which is which is not trivial. Um, and so because I have that, then uh, what I would get is uh, from, let's say one, I replace the other side with this, okay? Uh, less than um, sigma maximum of, um, this guy and one and G U T. Okay. Um, and then, uh, well, I, I need to do is, um, uh, considering the two cases separately. So, um, either I have one half, um, either this is bigger than the other, either this holds. So this is saying this holds, um, um, times G U T or this holds um, sigma g u t. So this is clearly saying delta hat two is less than two sigma g u t. And this is saying that um, um, I'm gonna simplify, I get this guy um, is less than um, two sigma g u t divided by u. So if I take the square root here, um, I get the square root. And then you can see that, that effectively what we're saying is that this is bounded by the maximum of the two. So either one, which is the maximum I can put there and that would be an upper bound. Okay. Um, and if you go back to the slides, that's exactly what we had. So, yeah, so that's the, this is just theta hat minus theta star. This holds the probability, which is, which is um, this. Okay, so this is a very simple basic inequality argument. The key point is this uh, uniform result that, that um, this sort of Gaussian process basically. So you can think of this as um, lemma one is controlling, controlling um, the um, supremum of a Gaussian process. So 
so this is a Gaussian process, this maps to this, and then so you're controlling the maximum. But you're controlling the maximum, the maximum also scales with the norm of, of this. So this, this, this type of inequality, if you can prove, um, generally they lead to interesting results. And, and so um, and here are the star shapes. So, um, so this, is the, this is where the star shape business comes in. And I'll, I'll post the um, homework and it's very useful for you to go through and try to, um, to argue this, okay? But modulo that, the, the proof is very simple. So it's finding a good upper bound in this and, and then being done with that, okay? Questions? Is it clear to everyone? Besides the lemma, which is admittedly not trivial, but Questions, comments. So it would be really helpful if you also go through the L, L, um, the lasso and see how that the, how the um, argument there sort of preceded. So what we did there, if you remember, we did like infinity here and then the L one, and then argued that this has to be in a certain code, um, and 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 then use the fact that that's in the cone to to simplify things. Um, so it all sort of, and then you can also like state that result as a uniform bound on, on this quantity if you want for basically for any delta. Um, so you have a bound on say um, this less than or equal to something for any delta in that cone object. Um, something like uh, this. Um, with high probability, yeah. So that's another way of seeing that the, this this argument is similar to that. So you have to control this this sometimes called process Gaussian process or sometimes empirical process, um, and um, if if you do it with the functions, it would be an empirical process. Um, questions. Okay, so now we have some options. So I'm uh, exhausted this um, main topic. So there are some options. So we can um, talk about, um, so there's one last piece, which I did not prove, which is the Studley's integral. So there is, um, so everything here is proven once you prove that lemma, except um, this, this um, so this is gonna be another homework problem. It's very easy. Uh, this is not easy. So this is the main sort of result that you can use uh, to control um, um, entropy numbers. Um, so we have some options. We can go through the proof of this. Uh, we can do another example. Uh, maybe next time go through the proof of this. Um, uh, maybe next time talk about the lower bound. Um, let me see if I can. Um, so any, um, so we can, for example, one option is to talk about the RKHS uh, example and see how these bounds would work out in the RKHS case. Um, and then I can talk a little bit about actually how to solve this, um, which is related to the RKHS business. Uh, the other one is to go through the chaining first. So let's see, what do you guys prefer? Do you want to see the proof of this? Or do you want to see like the RKHS example worked out here? First, maybe then this, or which one do you guys prefer? I should have probably like asked Nicole earlier. Any preference? Whoever talks first, probably, because no one seems to be talking. Whoever gets to talk first, probably will decide. Which um, way? Maybe Dudley's integral, Jerome. Okay. Uh, no other like objection. Is there like a second? Anyone second this motion or? 
okay, I'll, I'm gonna talk about this, then you'll have a complete proof here. And then um, maybe next time we'll talk a little bit about the RKHS and see if there's any um, interest in, in seeing the lower bound, maybe we'll be talking about the lower bound as well. Um, but, um, okay, so let's go back then to some slides. So any question about this set of slides? Okay, um, so, so that this integral requires this idea of um, chaining. So this is like, um, again, the, um, the slides that we went over earlier. So um, again, remind you that an epsilon cover um, or an epsilon net of a set T um, in a metric space um, um, endowed with a metric row is um, um, a, um, a discrete set of points um, such that any point, um, if you take any point in, in set T, there exists one of these guys um, such that theta is close to um, theta i, okay? It's um, within a radius of epsilon of that. Uh, point. Um, and then the epsilon, the, the, the epsilon covering number is the smallest cardinality of such a um, set. Okay, so again, uh, intuitively, if you put balls of radius epsilon around these points, they would, they would um, together, the union cover the set. Um, and there's this packing argument as well. So we, we went through like the estimates of these things. Um, and um, there was this other slide uh, that I did not go. So that's the, the, the entropy, if you recall, of the Lipschitz class that we um, talked about or used just now. Uh, the argument is there as well, if you're interested. Um, this is this is for, for the lower bound. So you, you find the packing and show that this, this is lower bounded by this, which is more interesting generally. It shows that the, uh, this is big enough, but you can also prove the upper bound uh, that, um, Okay, and then before before let me mention this as well. Um, uh, this is this is in the d, d, d dimension. So if you, you work with the d dimensional Lipschitz class, uh, then instead of l over delta to the uh, one, you get l over delta to the b, um, and then you can go back to 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 the argument that we did here. Um, maybe you all signed this homework problem, and then do this integral and see what the rate you get, uh, and the rate would be really terrible. So you can see as, as D grows, um, the rate becomes slower and slower. And so this is a manifestation of the um, carousel dimensionality. First, you can see that the log of this is dependent on um, this uh, exponentially in D. So the dimension uh, appears exponential. It just blows up exponential, exponentially. So you can see like, even if this is like two, this is gonna be two to the D, which is really bad as D grows. And then can, we can see the effect on the rate. Um, um, and then the effect of the smoothness, there is a bit of an argument. This is for the case of um, L equal, uh, the, the um, this is the equal one, uh, but um, you would assume that for the Lipschitz class, you, you'd see like one over delta. Um, and um, if you assume more smoothness, so if you if, it, if you assume that the, the derivatives are ex, the derivatives are there and they're bounded by um, constants up to like alpha, the alpha derivative is, is like that, um, and then um, more the alpha derivative uh, is like um, this is called Holder continuum. So if gamma is one, it would be this is Lipschitz, but let's say this is like some fraction between. Uh, zero and one. Um, so, so for this class, um, um, so the Lipschitz class would be like, uh, this is uh, alpha is uh, uh, one and then gamma is zero. That's the, the case that we consider. Um, this, this is a more general class and you can see that this is gonna be one over alpha plus gamma. And so this, this improves, so as, um, um, Instead so of blowing up as you increase alpha, this reduces the exponent. And then you can see what the effect this has on the, on the rate. So generally, if you increase alpha, um, then, um, so let's say gamma still is zero. If you increase alpha, you get uh, 
one over delta to the one over alpha. And it, alpha increases, the rate would improve. So that, that shows that um, the, sm the smoother the assumption and the crest, or the, 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 more, the more smoothness you assume about the crest, the, the easier the, the problem gets. So I encourage you to go through, maybe all side is one problem, to go through these rays and see uh, these, these entropy estimates and, and see how the um, uh, rate goes. And then the book has a, like a proof. The proof is simple. So you just change the, the set of basis functions. Not the basis, but the, 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 the packing here is, is constructed using um, certain, like certain, um, uh, what it's called, um, um, Linear subspaces of functions, you just you just change the base basic function there to something else, and so it's interesting. If you if you're interested, you can take a look at the book. Okay, um, so that's the set of slides. Um, uh, um, again, so this is this is the quantity that we care about. Um, so let's not worry about this. Is, these are the um, um, the the Gaussian complexity measures. So I, we we um, we are working with this. Um, there are alternative versions without the absolute value. This is sometimes called the Gaussian width. Um, and there's a relation between them if things are symmetric, but this is the quantity that we are interested in bounding. Um, so if you're interested, you can look at the HTP book. Um, there are some um, discussion of the relation of the Gaussian width versus the Gaussian complexity. Um, okay. Um, these are examples that we can take a look. So this is the Dudley's integral. Um, so here we are doing um, this. Okay, um, I'm missing the uh, slide that defines some Gaussian processes. So we did it for the Gaussian um, um, <clears throat> for the Gaussian. Um, well, we need it for the Gaussian. So the process that you're looking at here is <clears throat> x theta is um, w theta. Okay, and um, then the Gaussian width, you can think of it as um, um, Gaussian width of t. Um, and then theta is in, uh, so the process is um, x theta, theta in t, where x is like that. This is a linear Gaussian process. So w is um, normal zero identity. Um, this gamma, um, T would be the supremum or the expected uh, supremum over theta in, um, let's say T, uh, used to be capital theta, but let's say T, um, W theta, so this is just expected supremum of um, X theta, uh, theta in T. Um, and so the result, the Dudley's integral would hold uh, for any um, sub-Gaussian process, not necessarily this particular. This is a very special Gaussian process, but the result would hold for any sub-Gaussian process xt. Um, and the sub-Gaussian process is a process in which um, we'll see, but um, um, roughly speaking, x theta is, sub, is a sub-Gaussian um, process. If, uh, if you look at the increments, the, the, this, the difference between two values of the function, this is sub-Gaussian uh, for, any, for any pairs of theta and theta naught, um, with um, a sub-Gaussian parameter, which is um, uh, proportional to um, the natural distance between these two guys, um, or let's say sub-Gaussian norm. Um, Let's say this is the sub-Gaussian norm squared. Okay, uh, um, so this this guy d two theta and theta prime is just the expectation of x theta minus x theta prime. So this is uh, a natural distance. It's not a distance. This is like a pseudo metric. D uh, is a pseudo metric um, induced by the process, and um, the the sub-Gaussian process is a process in which the increments are sub-Gaussian with um, this is sub Gaussian parameter squared or the norm squared, sub Gaussian parameter squared, parameter uh, squared, uh, like this. In other words, um, 
the probability that x theta minus x theta prime is bigger than t is less than two x negative t squared. Uh, let's say c d uh, squared theta and theta prime. So the closer they get, um, the smaller, the, the closer the, the thetas are, the, the um, smaller the um, sub-Gaussian norm becomes. Okay, um, so this is saying that um, like if you think of this as a variance, um, uh, if this this is if this is zero mean um, um, quantity, this is really um, um, if the process is zero mean, uh, this is really the variance as a deviation. Uh, and so the variance you can think of it as a square distance, and, and this is saying that um, the, the 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 size of the deviation is controlled by this variance. Um, so Gaussian norm is controlled. Um, is this roughly clear? So these are some Gaussian processes. And you can easily see that this is, um, this is like that. Um, um, the constants might be like dependent on n, but um, so let's see. Um, yeah, we'll come back and, and like talk about the, the specific example here. Um, but is the, the notion of sub Gaussian processes clear? Sort of? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so we'll see how, how in the proof this, this works out. So now suppose you have a sub Gaussian process, zero means sub Gaussian process. Um, D is the diameter, again, the diameter of the set. Um, um, okay, so this metric, I, I guess we had to call it rho. I'm calling it rho there, which is a little bit better. So the, the Gaussian, um, sub-Gaussian, um, met, this metric is like induced by the process. So it's sub-Gaussian with respect to rho, rho is the natural metric, and then zero mean, um, and then the diameter of the set in that metric is, uh, is um, capital P. So now let n be a delta net for this guy. Um, then, um, the result is uh, the expected maximum of um, gamma unfortunately is an unfortunate notation. This is your book's notation, but let's say this is like theta or t, right? Um, maximum over theta in N uh, of this relative to a fixed point here. Um, so there's like a little bit of a, um, it's actually not a deviation. So if you go back to the, um, so this is, this is controlled by this. If you go back uh, to, to the linear, if this is a linear Gaussian process, this would look like um, theta minus theta star, theta naught. And so this is effectively um, in that center. Um, uh, so you can think of this as uh, saying that the maximum over um, theta in um, um, so the expectation of max um, let's say t in n minus theta naught of the w and t. Uh, and this is an epsilon net for theta, theta naught. If you remember, theta, theta naught is just a center version. So this all sort of works out. If you go back to the, the, the result that I mentioned, um, the fact that we are subtracting um, a fixed point here, which you have to do, uh, translates to the fact that we center the, the set theta at theta star. Okay, um, just in the yeah, like a linear Gaussian case that would be, but this is the more general version. Um, and you can see it goes from delta over four to D, that's the exactly how, how things would, would, would uh, was stated there. So there's this constant here. here. Uh, okay, so there is um, this, this kappa here is, um, I believe, um, Okay, so sub Gaussian, let's do it with sub Gaussian parameter. So this would be rho, this is a sub, the sub Gaussian parameter, not um, squared. Um, we'll see how this, this turns out, but I think this is like K here. Okay, so K is, um, um, this, this plays the role of um, K that we got for like, you usually assume that you have a, like a, for example, a Gaussian vector Sub-Gaussian vector is in fact the special case of a Gaussian pro sub-Gaussian process. Um, yeah, I should probably like assign these as homework problems. Um, 
I have to remember all of these because this is usually so. The sub Gaussian um, vector is a special case. So if you call what the sub Gaussian vector is a special case of sub Gaussian process. Um, okay, so that case is the constant that appears there, and this is a universal constant. Um, so the way that we actually prove this is, is a more stronger version, which is this um, prove this sum, and then the sum is approximated. This is an upper bound. So this is like, you know, like how these things go. So if you have like a sum, you can bound the sum by sort of um, things like this. So the sum, you can write it as like, um, this would be a partial sum of that integral. So the integral would be an upper bound and, and the, the, the partial sum. Um, or not partial sum, but the, um, so if you're not sure, I mean, this is a good exercise trying to show that this uh, this uh, is further upper bounded by that. So um, this is a like a closer bound to to this guy. Um, um, yeah, so the upper bound here can go all, all the way to um, infinity because at some point this is going to be like one. And so this is going to be zero. So you can also drop this, go all the way. Um, lower limit can be set to zero. Um, yeah, so these are some comments. So how do we prove this? Um, um, we're running out of time, but let me just point it out and come back next time and then finish it. Um, so the idea is um, um, we, um, we're going to look at um, epsilon nets of um, different resolutions. So you have epsilon k. Um, this is um, um, going to re 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 be reduced by a factor of two as you like go all, like from epsilon level one to epsilon level two. Uh, and um, so I think there's a picture here. Yeah. So um, so you'd have at first you have like um, like a net that maybe had these two points. Then then you had another net. Then you have another net. Uh, so at each layer, at each level, you have a net. Um, and the idea is that you have here um, an epsilon net uh, with radius this much, an epsilon net with radius this much, an epsilon net with radius this much, this this one, and, and so on. And at the, the final level, you would get to um, your delta, delta net. So that's the delta net that you are trying to um, um, control, right? So there's this delta net. So you dyadically go down from the diameter all the way to, um, at some point, um, you're going to be um, stopping. So delta would be between one of these and you need to stop. Um, and um, so the way that this works is that you can also make, um, make them nested in a sense. Um, I, I don't think we're going to use this. So, there, there are options to make them nested or, or not. So there are different, the two versions of the proof, depending on whether um, you reuse these from uh, the previous. So you can like have these and then add another point somewhere to make it um, a net. Um, I believe this proof that we have here from, this is also from um, HDS book, doesn't require them to be nested, just you have these, um, these nets uh, associated with these, um, 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 Epsilons. Okay, and then the first one, um, which is just um, um, the k equal to zero, we just take to be um, just that center, take the take the knot, um, and um, uh, then the quantity here is going to be. Um, uh, you can argue that it would be like um, the expected maximum over the the alt net. The alt net sort of coincides with. With the delta net that we have. Okay, so we need to control this. Um, so we define a projection uh, uh, map that maps T to uh, this net, and the projection is just the closest point. Uh, so basically, for every um, for every point here, uh, you map it to the closest. Um, so let's say this is this is the line. Um, so pi of this point. Is this um, pi of this point? Is that so? Every point is mapped to the closest point in the net, and then you can see by the property of the net that the distance of the point and its projection um, onto the kth net is, is bounded by epsilon k. 
that's the property of the net. This is um, uh, there is a there is a point in the net such that this is close to this, and so the closest point in the net should should have that property. Uh, and then the chaining relation, it's either of these two. It's either um, so you decompose this using a telescopic sum of the the value of the process at these projections of the previous layer versus the projection at the um, next level. Okay, uh, this is like an advanced discretization. So if you go back to discretization argument that we did in the um, um, example of um, the spectral norm of the matrices, you just have one net and basically you project onto that. Um, here, for any given theta, um, so this, this, if this is theta, at this level, you project it onto this, then the next level of the projection would be this, the next level of the projection would be this, and, and the next level would be that. And then so you, you have, so the value of the process at this point, um, you compare it with the value of this, which is, which is this, and then the value of the, pro the process at this level, um, which is that, and the value at this level. Um, um, and so this, the, the deviation of, um, um, uh, this from, let's say, the, the theta naught is here. So x, this is theta naught. So you have x theta naught here. So the deviation of this to this would be bounded by the deviation of this to that, and then plus this, plus that, and so on. Okay, so you like use the telescopic sum to control this via the distance of these, and, and there are a finite number of these projections. Um, and so we are out of time, but um, think about this. Um, Relation. There's an alternative relation, which is um, you also project back. Um, um, you have this, and then you project the projection back onto the previous uh, um, layer. Um, and both of them are correct. We're going to use this. Um, I'll post the slides. I have a look at the the, the proof. We're going to come back and and then see how um, this dyadics or construction allows you to control um, all these deviations together. Okay, sounds good. Um, sorry, we went a little bit over time, but uh, I'll post the slides. Um, have a look. Um, we can also look at the book, um, and then we can we can come back and and then finish this. Okay. Questions, comments.